the northwest coast of Scotland and its summer visitors. We're up near the tiny villages of Clactoll and Stour. The area has a long history of human occupation on the very edge of Scotland. But it has a geological history that stretches way back into the distant past. Well, another sunny day in northwest Scotland. I've come up here to the coast between the villages of Stour and Clanktoll to look for some evidence of a violent past. It's going to be quite a surprising story. Well, of course, structures like this, it's a broch, point at times of violence. There's no reason for building this kind of structure in peacetime. But we're not really interested in the archaeology here. We're interested in the geology which provided these stones. We're going to get out of the broch and go over to the rocks on the other side of the bay. And that geology is going to tell a story that's far more violent than anything that's happened in human history. These are the oldest sedimentary rocks in the British Isles. And they lie on an even older basement, the Louisian Nice the ancient continental crust of Scotland, pushing three billion years old. Seen on this geological map, the Louisian is the stripy stuff. The younger sedimentary rocks are those dingy dark colours on the coastal headlands and also in land. We know these as the Torridonian supergroup, which make the classic sandstone hills of the Assint district. But our story lies in an older part of the Torridonian. And this is its type area. These are the Stour group, deposited 1.2 billion years ago. These old strata were deposited on a rugged ancient landscape. Little hills and valleys that were rather similar in scale to the modern landscape. So we find basal breaches and conglomerates shed off the little hills, preserved in what must be ancient paleo valleys. But this rough landscape was soon lost as the geological record continued to play. So those breaches there which carpet the edge of that uh, hill of Louisian Nice, well they're just a veneer on that landscape and quite quickly the geology passes up into these rocks here which I'm sat on, which are red mudstones, they're lacustrite, so lake deposits. So we're in a continental environment 1.2 billion years ago. But this isn't the exciting bit. We're going to move up the section and see what happens. So we're crossing over now to continue to move up through the succession of the Stour group, which is really nicely exposed along the shore of the Bay of Stour. So the rocks we've come to see are down there on that little promontory. Doesn't look like there's much going on really, does there? Just a set of gently dipping strata climbed out to sea. But there's one particular layer that's really dramatic. We'll save that for a minute. Let's just go and see the context of what the surrounding strata look like. So 
So these are pretty typical of this part of the stir group. They're fluvial sandstones. You can still see good cross bedding in them. Really well sorted, which means that on occasion, after they're deposited, they tend to remobilize a little bit and um, make folds and so forth. But that's quickly uh, sealed by the next package of sand that's deposited on top. So you get these built upon layer upon layer sand bodies like this. So really simple sedimentary geology, no tectonic deformation apart from that gentle tilt. So it looks like a really peaceful world and you have a hard time really reconciling this with the fact these are 1.2 billion year old rocks. Okay, well, let's continue and see what happens when we go to a rather particular part of this succession. So I followed these nice bedded store group sandstones all the way through to here, but the game is about to change just up there. I'm going to go over there, take my rocks off, off and have an explore. The outcrops here contain disrupted layers of sandstone encased in a matrix of this stuff, which is a thick, unlayered or massive unit with abundant lumps of dismembered sandstones of all shapes and sizes in a muddy soup. So here's a nice clean outcrop away from this lichen and algal black cover. We've got some fresh material in here. First of all, I can see class in here, which are, well, they're nice is sort of a pegmatite piece in here. So Louisian basement. But um, we've seen on our tour along this outcrop, almost all of this material is actually uh, the class, so almost all uh, sandstones. But what else have we got in here? Well, there's lots of these green shards which are some of which are streaked out and flattened so a very composite type of stuff this it's a sort of a micro brechery sort of material all sorts of material caught up in it so floating around in this uh, background material well, they're rafts of sandstone, detached, folded, incorporated into this material. So, is it a debrite, a mass flow, like a pile of slurry coming down a slope? Let's keep exploring. What about the dismembered and deformed sandstone beds, like rafts floating in a thick matrix of the debritic stuff? These raft structures are pretty dramatic. I'm sort of following this one along here. We can trace it along around this corner and see that it's sort of folded up like this. So, rafts of folded sandstone within this sort of matrix material. Well, this is really dramatic. There's a layer here of sandstone. It's been folded. So whenever this happened, it must be pretty soft and gloopy, but it's entirely detached. It's a lump floating 
in this matrix and we can see we've got other rafts here that I'm stood on top of that have been flipped up a bit away from the general dip which should be down like this so we've got some pretty curious deformation here with flaps of sandstone lifted up well what about what sits between what's doing the lifting what sits under the flap So here's a piece of intact sandstone which we can tape up and we can see that just there, here, it basically stops to be replaced by this material which is the surrounding stuff. And I can see this forms a layer running out along this direction. Let's follow it a bit. So these look like regular sandstone still nicely bedded not disrupted at all then we've got this layer we're following along and we can see that it basically looks like it's bedded in with the sandstone but we know it isn't because this upper sandstone layer is flipped up and broken off further down the outcrop so this is squirted in between the layers the beds of sandstone. Really quite remarkable. So this is pretty interesting material. It's got blocks of the surrounding sandstones within it. If we look closely there are also these other fragments which are interpreted to be devitrified glass. So at least some of this material was once molten. So, what's its origins? Well, the obvious answer is this stuff is volcanic. It represents an extrusive igneous rock, a volcanic mudflow, or lahar, that ripped up the underlying sediment as it flowed. But the catch is, there are no other volcanic rocks in this section. Our putative volcano, then, only erupted once, and that's just implausible. But there's more information we can add. This debritic material contains quartz grains, and many of these are shocked. They have planar fractures or healed fractures within them, microtextures that are indicative of hypervelocity impacts. And then there's the geochemistry. Those little glassy shards are enriched in chromium, nickel and cobalt. Values beyond terrestrial levels, but common in meteorites. Furthermore, they're enriched in the isotope 53 chromium. Enriched compared to the Stir group and the Lewis in Nice, but comparable with those found in meteorites. So the view now is that this material was ejected from a meteor impact crater. So a base surge of sediment and rock debris roared through here, tearing up its substrate. These rocks are collectively known as the stacked Fada member of the Stir group. So what do impact craters look like? Well, for that, we need to leave our planet and find somewhere where the geological preservation is better than our Earth. Of course, there's the Moon. But the surface conditions of the Moon are not the same. It's dry. But the 1.2 billion year old Earth was wet. We know that from those fluvial sandstones and lake deposits. So where our crater formed, the Earth's surface was soft, wet sediment. So, to find a comparable extraterrestrial example, we need to go to Mars. But Mars, 3.8 billion years ago, while it still had substantial liquid water and a damp planetary surface. Just look at the splatter of the ejector blanket, partially swept away by former rivers. 
So let's get back to earth and the outcrops at Stur. Well, so far, we've really only been looking at what happens when the crater ejector interacts with the immediate substrate. But then, of course, it begins to blanket the landscape in all this material. How thick did it get? And how did the impact geology end? The blanket here at the Bay of Stur is around 10 to 12 metres thick. So I've come to the very top of the ejector. Still lots of fragments in here. I can still see there pieces of Louisian caught up, fragments of this little glassy or devitrified glass, very fragmental. But then literally the layer I'm sat on going on up just becomes a layer of mud and silt. So we can imagine an ejection very energetic base surge flushing out, carrying the coarser material out away from the crater, and then a whole pile of dust going up into the atmosphere and raining down afterwards. So the likelihood is, I guess, that the original ejector base surge lasts a matter of minutes. So we build up all that succession very quickly, and then over the intervening hours, the ash cloud just drifts down and carpets the land. After that, of course, we just go back to normal and those fluvial sands just continue to build out across the landscape. So, a very violent day in the life of this part of Scotland about 1.2 billion years ago. Well, these have been some pretty dramatic outcrops. But where was the crater? How big was it? So what can we learn from the class composition within all this material here? Well, almost all of it are the local sandstones. But there are occasional class, as we've seen, of the Louisian basement. So our crater, when the meteor struck, excavated down just a little way into the underlying crystalline basement through the sedimentary cover. Now, we don't really know how thick uh, these strata were, but let's assume they're about a kilometer thick, which is sort of the maximum preserved that you can recognize in uh, this part of northwest Scotland. Well, if that's the case, then the crater is only going to be maybe one, one and a half, perhaps two kilometers deep. And from that, we can get an idea of how big the crater was. And we can get that idea by comparisons with Martian craters. Using this comparison in 2019, Kenamore and co-workers estimated that the excavation just down into the Louisian through a cover of damp stir group sediment means the crater for the Stackfada was about 10 to 15 kilometers across. How far away was this crater? What can we learn from those craters formed by impacts into an ancient, damp Martian planetary surface. Generally, the wet ejector blankets on Mars extend no more than 1.8 times their crater widths. Using maximum values for crater width, Ken Amor and colleagues estimated that the crater for the Stackfader rocks lies no more than 30 to 40 kilometers from our site. But where was this crater? Can we use the fold structures here as directional indicators? 
Well, let's look at the rampart craters on Mars. The ejector can form complex lobe shapes, so the fold orientations are likely to be complex too. But that means then it's quite difficult to use the geometry of these fold structures to say anything about the uh, direction that the um, ejectite was flung and therefore the position of the crater. It could almost have come from anywhere, uh, from any given fold structure. But we can use the class entrained in the ejector blanket to help. Ken Amor and colleagues match the Lewisian clasts to basement types that lie not to the north, but towards the south of Stur. But the Lewisian rocks onshore show no evidence for the massive fracture damage you'd expect for an impact site. So the crater is likely to lie offshore, somewhere buried beneath the minches. And this is about as far as we can take things, at least for now. Still, that's not bad for a piece of forensic geology, exploring a dramatic event that's over a billion years old. So these are some pretty dramatic outcrops and a really dramatic story of a few hours to maybe a day of activity 1.2 billion years ago when a meteor struck this part of Scotland leaving this ejector blanket in the geological record. So that's been a quick look at the geology of Stackfarder. Of course, we could go to Mars to see this sort of thing preserved in three dimensions. But here we've got it preserved in Northwest Scotland from 1.2 billion years ago. And we can really get our hands on to the structures and see the preservation of these remarkable rocks. It's a great place to come and visit.